All right. Thanks for joining our Weave online user group. Uh, this, today's topic is on Cube ADM, which hopefully some of you are here because you want to learn something about it, or maybe you are uh, well versed with it and you're interested in the new version. So either way, thanks for coming. My name is Tama Onakahara. I'm head of developer experience at a company called Weaveworks. And today our speaker is Lucas Kallstrom, who is on our developer experience team. So we're very lucky to have him. So I'll do a quick introduction and some housekeeping, and then we'll get into the talk, and you'll be able to ask questions. Uh, Lucas, do you have a preference for questions throughout your talk or at the end? Uh, throughout, any time is, is good. Yeah. Okay, excellent. And so uh, I'll give a little bit of information about the chat box and how you can ask those questions. So before we get started, just a little bit about us. So thanks for your patience. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, our company is called Weave Works. Uh, we're a startup based in London, New York, San Francisco, and Berlin, and we have distributed teams throughout the world. Uh, if you've heard of RabbitMQ, our founders, our CEO, CTO, and some of our engineers and staff are from the RabbitMQ days. They invented, created RabbitMQ, and sold off the company to VMware. Uh, and then they started noticing needs in the container and Kubernetes space to start creating projects uh, under the guise of Weaveworks. Uh, we have funding from a variety of VCs. One is Google Ventures, which makes sense in our experience in the Kubernetes community, as, as well as Excel Partners and a few others. Uh, so we'll be talking a lot about open source in this series, if this is the first time you've ever come to our weekly series. Uh, some of us, a lot of people know us from WeaveNet, which was the first uh, project that we put out there. Uh, then we have Cortex and Flux, which is, um, so Cortex is in the CNCF and Flux is in process into, into going into the CNCF. Uh, we also have WeaveScope, WeaveFlagger, and actually we've got a few others as well. So this is really uh, grounded in our history in open source. Uh, but we're also a company, we need to make money. So um, we have products. Uh, one is Weave Cloud, which we've had the longest, which is a SaaS product that helps you uh, manage your Kubernetes clusters, get monitoring, and do automated deployments. Uh, we're also um, developing out a Kubernetes platform. So a little background, we have um, four years of running Kubernetes in production because we've been running Kubernetes, uh, Weave Cloud on Kubernetes on AWS. And to do that, we sort of had to build out a layer which now we're productizing. And so it's a very GitOps aware enterprise Kubernetes uh, platform. So. Uh, People, when they get on that journey, sometimes they need help as well. So sometimes consulting and training and support comes with that. So if any of you are interested in that, um, please let me know and uh, we can talk about that later. So our company is weave.works. If this is the first time you're hearing about us, please check us out and feel free to ask us questions. Thanks for your patience with that. Now a little bit of housekeeping. So as I mentioned, we have Lucas Kallstrom, who's uh, on our team, but also well known um, in the Kubernetes community as a contributor and as a CNC and, uh, CNCF ambassador. Um, he's involved with many SIGs. He'll talk to, uh, um, quite a bit about that. Uh, my name is Tomo. I'm head of developer experience here. And uh, we bracket out these sessions to be um, as short as 30 minutes, uh, generally around 45 minutes, but if there's really a lot of questions, we'll go up to 60, but the hard stop will be at 60, but generally we're about 45 minutes. Uh, we're using a platform called Zoom, so um, if you want to ask questions to Lucas, um, you can ask throughout the talk and um, use the chat box. That's the best way to do it, uh, and make sure that uh, when you do ask, um, hopefully you can ask to everyone or to all panelists and attendees so that people can see your questions and then sometimes people um, answer them. So you want to make sure that your chat is being seen by everybody. Unless you have something burningly private, then you could just send it to me. Uh, if you have trouble finding the chat uh, box, sometimes getting um, out of full screen mode by hitting escape can uh, make it easier to find the Zoom panel. Uh, and then there's a little bit of information here on help and support, but I believe we are good to go. So with that, I will hand it over to Lucas. Mm, there we go. Hi, everyone, and thanks for coming. My name is, as Tamara said, Lucas, and um, I've been doing different stuff in the Kubernetes ecosystem for the past three, four, years. Um, I started out by porting Kubernetes to ARM, which was my pet project at home uh, doing Raspberry Pis. And um, since then, I've done a lot of, of different 
work on uh, cluster lifecycle in Kubernetes. So basically, how can we make cluster installation and set up upgrades, etc., cetera, um, easy and smooth. And um, by this time, I, I noticed WeWorks and um, teamed up with them, joined, joined the team when we created the, the Kubernetes product and, um, or project in, in Kubernetes. And uh, that's what we're going to talk about today. Let me share my screen. Let me know if I have to unshare. I'll go ahead and just stop share. Yes. Oh, Maybe okay. now. Yep. Looks good. Perfect. So I'm gonna I'm gonna reuse one of the the earlier presentations for a quick Sig plus to lifecycle intro. This is from a, a previous community meeting update I did, and. Um, and this is just to give you a background of, of what the cluster lifecycle space looks like. As Tamar said, I'm one of the chairs for this, this uh, special interest group. And uh, we think a lot about cluster creation, configuration, upgrade, teardown, everything uh, related to that. But it's also a lot of um, developer experience, a lot of user experience. Um, and as this quote says, we spend a lot of time trying to balance user experience versus power and flexibility. And the, the AJ um, feature is a, a really good example of this, uh, which we'll come to later. And it should scale. We are a large, a large SIG, um, but we always encourage contributions if you're interested after this, after this talk. Um, we have m more than 15 different subprojects, projects uh, being just one of them. And um, yeah, a lot of members in the Slack um, and contributions, et cetera. So a quick overview. We have, um, as I said, more than 15 different subprojects. And uh, let's start with Kubedium, looking at that. Um, that's pretty much in the middle. Uh, it, it does one thing and does one thing really well. Well, we're going to come to this. Then we have stuff um, below Kubedm, which uh, we're developing at CDADM. We have stuff above Kubedm, dealing with add-ons. And we have cluster API wrapping the full package. And along with these, we have conf uh, configuration, declarative configuration, which uh, plays well with, for example, GitOps later when you want to do that mm, across all this stack and also a set of cluster provisioners in open source if, if you want them. COPS or KubeSpray are examples. So Kubedm, if you haven't heard of it before, here is a conceptual picture of it. So at the bottom of the stack, you have some kind of infrastructure. This infrastructure, be it a cloud, be it my set of Raspberry Pis at home or some on-prem hardware, uh, you have some machines. They can be physical, virtual, whatever in between, but some compute. Um, on each machine here, you run Kubedm, and then Kubedm executes locally and does what you say it should do. Uh, today, we're going to talk about AJ. So, for example, we'd create three masters or control plane nodes also called, and uh, execute various Kubernetes commands on these. And then later, we can join more nodes. And um, Kubernetes is solely uh, con like, uh, responsible for this middle layer. It once cluster creation is done, and, or bootstrapping is done, and the cluster is conformant, um, other tools will take over. And uh, here is a good picture of this that, um, for example, something like, as Tamao said, the, the uh, WeWorks Kubernetes uh, platform um, is, is then this full package or COPS or KubeSpray or similar uh, that provides all of the things. It has uh, provisioning of the infrastructure. It has it runs KubeADM in the, the middle, but it also does stuff like cloud provider integrations and load balancers, monitoring, logging, 
UIs maybe, etc. So it really depends on, on what you need. And um, KubeADM, we created the project to be able to have one tool that does cluster bootstrapping really well. So that every provider, because uh, there's like more than 90, I think there's, there's 100 certified Kubernetes installations today. And um, these, all, all these 100 installations need to, to do the, essentially the same thing. They need to set up the API server and they need to configure the same set of certs, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And this is what KubeADM helps it and DIY on-prem installations. Uh, we'll skip through the rest of these, I think. Yes, and go directly to KubeADM docs. So if you, how to get started? Um, you basically Google for KubeADM and the first match there is, is gonna take you to the right page. Uh, we recently with the one five, uh, 15 uh, release, we got a logo, which was, which was nice. Um, KubeADM is in general availability, in GA, so it's stable. And uh, it has uh, the same support time frame as Kubernetes, which is nine months or three, three releases. Um, how to get started with it is basically running KubeADM in it. And um, well, it, you need to install it, but that is provided or, or OS specific, but we have uh, apt-get and yum repos. So it's, it's, it's fairly straightforward. But let me, let me do, uh, let's see if this works. So once I have, oh, I didn't clean up after myself. Mm, there we can go. You, can you zoom in just a touch? I can see it, but. There we go, maybe now. So yeah, what good. I, yeah, what I run here is basically kubeadm in it and I'm, I'm just doing a quick um, live demo of uh, what, it, what it means to, to run kubeadm. And um, so, so you, you run it, uh, you see that first it's creating a set of certificates and uh, there's a lot of certificates needed in, for running a Kubernetes cluster. Uh, we can check them out, but I think it's around 15 um, needed. And then we uh, bootstrap the, the control plane and uh, do some, some stuff, for example, creating a join token and uh, marking the, the ex first node as uh, a master. Lastly, we're applying core DNS and kube proxy. So there we go. Our, cube, our first node, our master, is now successfully bootstrapped. Great. Um, we see that we have now two, three action items to do next. One is to use the, uh, the, the cube config file in order, or in other words, the, the file to use for connecting to the Kubernetes cluster is available at Etsy Kubernetes admin conf. So I'm gonna create the uh, Etsy Kubernetes admin conf. So now I'm setting the cube config environment variable. And uh, now I can use kubectl, uh, get pods for example. There are no pods because I don't have any. Um, and if we run kubectl get node, we can see that there is one node, the gopher, which is my machine, and it's not ready. It's not ready because we haven't installed a um, CNI plugin yet. So CNI stands for container network interface and um, is, is the thing that provides networking between machines. And in, in this case, we're gonna use uh, Weave. So this is, this is Weave net applying here. And um, now after some minute, we will see the, the, this node to transition to the ready state. And now we can start 
uh, doing workloads. After this is done, we see that we have a join token here. So this command, you can use this command in order to, to join new control plane nodes. Uh, sorry, sorry. You can use this command to join new normal nodes that aren't control plane nodes. So regular nodes with this token. And now we see that the status is ready for, for this machine. Um, so that's, that's basically it for the, the like one master example. We run Kubernetes in it, we install CNI, and now if I would have more compute than my laptop here, I could add uh, more nodes to this command. To clean up after myself, I do kubet and reset. There we go. Then um, we're getting into the exciting stuff, what we're here, to, here for today. Um, high availability. So there's, there's a couple of, of different matters here. First and foremost, we need to have highly available storage. So etcd needs to be set up in a highly available way. Directly there, there's two possibilities. We can have, if we have three control plane nodes, we can run etcd on each of these three existing nodes, also serving API server workloads. This can work well in some scenarios, and this is what we have provided. Um, that's, this is what we've made way easier in the 115 release, which is really exciting. Actually, I uh, did not open that directly, but here it is. So I, um, I wrote a blog post together with Fabrizio Pandini, another QBEDM sub-project owner. And we, we highlighted in this post, which went out on June 20, uh, 24th, how the new highly available uh, mode works. And um, there we go. We're going to look at that in a moment. And um, this is the... the New, the new mode that we have uh, added in 115 is that you do the normal kubedm join uh, command, but this time you also specify the control plane flag and a certificate key. And with this, you can, using the same easy way that you did before, you can join new, new control plane nodes, new masters to a cluster with only two added parameters before you had to do a lot of more work. And that sets up a stacked etcd for you. So on every, every master, on the first master, you run kubedm init. On the second master and third, you run kubedm join and dash dash control plane on these. And that is gonna join etcd to the, to the cluster, its own etcd cluster here. The other uh, possibility is to extract this and uh, provide three or more, five dedicated hosts, dedicated machines for running a CD and then have some kind of load balancer or I don't know, round robin DNS in front. So those, those two are the, the main ways of running a CD. Uh, then as you see in, the bo in both pictures, you need to have some kind of load balancer in front. So all worker nodes connect to one sort of endpoint, and this endpoint load balances to the API servers accordingly. Which also means that the load balancer needs to take into account, for example, where uh, the, the case where one API server goes down, and uh, now it should, um, load balance requests only to two of these. Um, the, therefore, the load balancer needs to have some kind of health checking and similar 
Also, another tricky case is when upgrading Kubernetes, um, then you need to coordinate with the load balancer that it serves the right requests, etc. Right. So that's yeah. And and the the third tricky issue here is uh, common certificates. So you need to have a, a centralized CA um, certificate authority between all of these. You need to have some keys and, and um, public keys need to be the same on all of these machines. So somehow from, where you go, from the first, uh, first machine, first master, where you run Kubernetes in it, you need to copy over the certs to the rest, rest of the control planes in order to run more API servers, connect to that CD cluster and similar. And this is what the certificate key is about. So if we go to here on the same section, uh, creating highly available clusters with Kubernetes. Here you can see that first the, the in normal installation requirements and um, then create a load balancer. And um, this is something we can't provide for you basically, uh, unfortunately, but from, from the Kubernetes uh, project from Cyclus Lifecycle, we, we can't really say that this is the only way to do a load balancer because, well, every environment is different. So you, you choose basically, basically, but we have some reference um, examples too that you can use to, to make it easier. Anyways, let's take a look at the, the stacked control plane and etcd. Uh, mode and the new kubedm join uh, new kubedm join command. So what we begin with is to create a kubedm configuration file. This is important because we have a set of flags to kubedm, but they can't really provide every single mode that possibly could could be uh, configured in Kubernetes. Can't have a flag. So that's why we have declarative and structured and versioned configuration in files for giving to the kubedm command. So here we have a cluster configuration in the kubedm API group. We set Kubernetes version to stable. And here we declare where is our load balancer running? So how can we connect to the load balancer in this configuration file? Next, we run kubedm init on the seed on the first master that we have. We run kubedm init with this initial configuration and we specify that the certs that it creates, the CA and um, uh, all the, the relevant keys and uh, certificates should be uploaded, encrypted and temporarily to a secret in the Kubernetes cluster. This is only for bootstrapping purposes, but it makes bootstrapping way easier. Mm. This command is gonna output that now you have two options. Either you join a normal work node as usual, or you paste this longer command into into uh, the next master that you wanna join. So uh, what options does it have? Kubernetes join the IP of the initial master or the load balancer endpoint. Next, the, the token that is used for connecting to, uh, to the API server for authentication and also uh, validation of what API server it is. Here we have a short um, hash of the, the CA that the cluster uses. So when kubernetes join talks to the existing running API servers, it can be sure that it's talking to the right, mm, talking to the right place, um, talking to the right API server, so it doesn't get, get uh, joined to, to the wrong place. And um, then I see we have a bug in the docs. Uh, this should be just control plane, not experimental control plane. 
we can fix that later. But it's, it outputs the right thing in, in, uh, if you run kubeadm today. And uh, that says that, that specifies that kubeadm should join this new machine as a control plane. And lastly, the certificate key. As said, when, uh, when the certs are and CA is uploaded to the, the cluster in a secret, it's first encrypted. And this is the decryption key for that. Right, do we have any questions at this point? I think it would be a good, good time to, to take a pause. There's a question asking, uh, what's a control plane node? So it's the same thing. Uh, yeah, sorry for that. So it's the same thing as a master. That you, so it, it, it's, it's a more politically correct version of uh, the word master. So basically, I'm using the word master because it's, in this case, it's easier to, to um, understand. But, but the official naming of what we could call a master is a control plane node. So a control plane node is a Kubernetes node that hosts the API server, controller manager, and scheduler. And hence, this is the, the, has the control plane uh, binaries on it. Does that mean overall we stop using master and worker? Yes. Interesting. Very cool. Yes. <laughs> Another question, is it a Docker control plane? So, um, Docker can be used uh, as the container runtime. So, uh, do I have any good pictures of this diagrams? I don't actually know if I have any pre-made, um, but um, yes, I do. Um, hold on. Yeah, this, this was a good question because um, now I get to show the architecture of Kubernetes, which is not straightforward. So there we have it. Um, let's see if it loads. So there's a, there's a few things going on in a Kubernetes cluster. We have the user talking to some kind of um, a load balancer or directly to an API server. The API server uh, responds with JSON. Um, using the, the well-known Kubernetes APIs. It handles authentication, authorization, different webhooks and all kinds of stuff. It's really the heart of the, the system. The API server is the only one that accesses etcd at any time. It's only the API server that can write to etcd. And etcd is then the single source of truth for the desired state in the cluster. Etcd is uh, another, C uh, another CNCF project, and it's basically a, a key value JSON database. Then we have the controller manager that is doing all the loops. So it, it's reconciling the state all the time. And um, so for example, to take a practical example, if I have an Nginx deployment, and I say that my Nginx deployment should have 10 replicas at any given point in time. Now, if one node that was uh, running two uh, Nginx instances, two containers with Nginx, uh, if that node goes down, dies somehow, the controller manager will eventually see that, oh, now this node is unavailable, it has failed. Now I, I ought to be running 10 Nginx um, replicas, but I am actually running just eight. So then it will reschedule two of the, the, pod, the failed pods on some other healthy node. And that is a loop that, that's like 
20 different loops in the controller manager running all time all the time the, then we have the scheduler so when you create a deployment um, the controller manager first sees that the deployment should have a replica set the replica set should have a set of pods when we have a set of pods the scheduler kicks in and uh, assigns a pod to a node that is uh, available for this workload. Once the, the pod is bound to a node, we have the node agent of Kubernetes, the kubelet, uh, watching the API server. And now this kubelet sees, it can be a master node or it can be a normal node. Um, now this kubelet sees that I have a workload to run. And it goes ahead and fetches the specifications from the API server that I should be running an Nginx, node, uh, Nginx pod. Um, next, we have the container runtime. And this is where Docker came, comes in. So here in the control plane box, we have a set of control plane nodes. So whether we, we have these in three or five or seven different uh, control planes uh, replicas, it doesn't matter from the node's perspective because they only connect to the API server, that's common endpoint. And if that's behind the load balancer or not, um, it doesn't really matter. But here, the kubelet, now that it knows it should be running an Nginx pod, it says to Docker using a common format called CRI, so container runtime interface, that let's run this pod let's run this Nginx container. And Docker, or there's uh, ContainerD, there's uh, Cryo, there's uh, Rocket, and many more that can do this container runtime, uh, be the container runtime here. And eventually, this is using the, the OCI specification, which is the Open Containers Initiative specification of what a container looks like and that then propagates down to the operating system, which is Linux or Windows. And when the pod is created, uh, we have the third party networking layer, hence it's in yellow here, uh, which can be then, for example, WeaveNet that connects all the workloads on this, uh, on this node to all the workloads on this node and this node. So we have a, a good set of uh, connectivity and service discovery. Does that answer the question? I certainly hope so. <laughs> that was quite a deep dive from the question. Um, but no, definitely really helpful. Um, yeah, please ask if you have more follow-ups of that. Um, but we have many other questions here, so let's get to those. Um, does etcd do replication? Um, how does it sync, um, or how do they sync each other in HA? Yes. Um, this is uh, one of my better presentations. <laughs> it has these two. Uh, <laughs> so it uses uh, a thing called Raft. So it's a, it's a consensus protocol. Um, I don't know, I, I've got to be honest there, I haven't ever implemented Raft, so I don't know the really, really, really technical details about it. But the, the basic idea of it is that you have a set of peers, for example, um, three peers, and these peers um, elect a leader. Um, once you have a leader in this, call, in this uh, picture called master, you, you sync the state between the, the, um, the different peers and they will, they will check that, do I have the latest data or uh, do I not? And when, um, when one, uh, they all talk to each other, and uh, when one peer is, is lost for some reason, they uh, etcd or the Raft consensus protocol elects a new leader that distributes the work within the, the cluster uh, on itself. And as long as there's um, more than fifty percent uh, of the the of available peers based of the the like cluster size. So if you have, uh, it works. So if you have three um, peers, you can afford to lose one and your cluster is still functional. 
if you have five pairs, you have to have, or like, it only works for real, or like, um, it's effective if you have odd numbers. So if you have five pairs, you can afford to lose two pairs, and still the cluster is functional because it has 60% of the capacity uh, alive. So yeah, that's, maybe that answers the question in, in somewhat good, good detail, but uh, uh, there, you can read on the, the Raft uh, consensus protocol. It's, it's pretty sophisticated. Um, it's a paper, yeah. Excellent. Um, is the load balancer also highly available or is it a single point of failure? So the, yeah, that, that's a good question. Um, it really depends on how you do it. So <laughs> it would be nice if it's not a single point of failure because that defeats the whole purpose of, of you running highly available in the, in the first time, uh, in the first place. But Yes, you can engineer it in a way that, um, where did I have this? Maybe, was it here too? Um, no. Um, I have one um, presentation, other presentation, which shows this. Uh, but let's, let's use this um, for now. So the idea is that you would use, for example, a cloud load balancer that, that has good, um, that, that is uh, really highly available. And you let the, the cloud load balancer do, do the hard stuff for you. If you don't have that, you can use AJ proxy and uh, virtual IP to, to do the same thing. Uh, that's a lot of different, uh, keep alive D, there's a lot of different uh, guides on, on how to do this. Um, and uh, that's one way to do on bare metal, do this kind of, uh, highly available load balancer. But yes, if you don't think really uh, deeply about it, 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 it can definitely be a, a thing you miss and uh, that you can catch first. There we have it. Uh, that you catch first in, in when it's too late. So I have another talk from before, which, yes. So this is another way to picture it. Um, and this was like some years ago. So then it was do it yourself. Now we have this really nice mode, which puts etcd in on each master, the stacked uh, etcd thing and automatically copies the certificates, sets up etcd, but you still have to provide the load balancer. And yes, no, this is not a uh, highly available setup. It's multi-master because it has multiple masters, but it's not highly available because there we have a single point of failure. There's also other, um, other parts of it that goes towards being higher. DNS you're running in the cluster. If one master uh, goes down, and uh, then the whole DNS resolution for all the the stuff in your cluster goes down for a certain period of time. It, I mean, the controller manager auto heals it, but it could take like one minute or two uh, for that to happen. So that's not too bad uh, or too good. Um, but yes, so on bare metal, you can use AJ proxy and keep alive D. You can use a set of, um, also, DNS works um, to some extent, but then um, it can be tricky if, for example, one of the, the nodes you're round robbing DNS uh, to goes down and you don't discover it um, as fast as you should. Mm. But there's, there's diff uh, many different um, 
topologies on this, but one of the most important parts is that you have A, multiple load balancers, um, B, the load balancers check the, the API server uh, health. So if, if the API server goes, any API server goes down, they stop load balancing there. And um, then uh, lastly, that you have some kind of either DNS or other resolving mechanism, some endpoint for a load balances that is uh, highly available too. I think that should answer the question. Hopefully, yes. We have quite a few more. Um, so when uh, joining the control plane node, uh, could you explain a little more detail about the CA-cert that you pass to the certificate key? Does that make sense? So let's look at the command. Uh, where did I have it? So yes, or maybe in this post is better. So what you pass to kubedm join here, when if you want to to join a master, is first the token, and this is a so-called bootstrap token, which lets you for a short period of time. Um, by default, for uh, by default for joining control planes, I think it's uh, one or two hours. I thought it said it says somewhere here. Um, anyway, it's one or two hours, and then the bootstrap token expires. That's why we have a token, not some more long-lived thing. Um, this is a hash of the CA cert, which. Kubedm join uses to trust the so so like the token is used so that the API server trusts the kubedm join command, and this is the other way. We have the the CA cert hash so that kubedm join can trust that it's joining the right API server and not some malicious um, API server, and uh, then we have control plane which enables this mode. And lastly, the certificate key here is the thing that when you bootstrap your first, when you bootstrap your first master, you run kubedm in it. When you bootstrap your second, you run kubedm join dash dash control plane. And when you you bootstrap your first um, uh, the the first master. Mm, Kubernetes created a, a, a CA uh, certificate authority and loads of certificates, like 15 something. And um, then the, the a small fraction of these that are need uh, the, of the certificates that need to be on the say all, all the, the same uh, uh, control plane nodes are uploaded to the cluster as a secret. So that's why we, but they are encrypted when they are uplo uploaded to the cluster as a secret and they expire in really a short time. So if you, in that period of time, run kubedm join dash uh, control plane on this second node, it's gonna talk to the APIs over here, download the right certificates. And with this, um, this certificate key is a decryption key. So it's gonna decrypt the contents of the secret, and now it can generate its own certificates locally. Cool, thanks. Many more questions. Um, please clarify how Kubernetes knows IP for load, the load balancer, and how this relates to external IP addresses assigned to the load balancer services. Could you please repeat that? Yeah. <laughs> so uh, clarify how Kubernetes knows the IP for the load balancer. That's, I guess, part one of the question and how yes. that knowledge relates to external IP addresses that are assigned to load balancer services. So in short, the, the A version, uh, it doesn't. Kubernetes doesn't know about your infrastructure, um, really. So it's something you need to feed to Kubernetes. So 
if I run this kubedm join command, I need to feed it the load balancer endpoint there. So I need to tell Kubernetes where is the endpoint available. And here in the beginning, highly available. Here, I need to tell Kubernetes where is my load balancer running. And uh, this is the kind of stuff that if you wanted, if you wanted something that, um, how to say it? If, if you want a solution that automatically does this and integrates with a specific environment like Google Cloud or I don't know, Amazon, AWS, Azure, DigitalOcean, or your preferred uh, local on-prem stack, mm, then you need some kind of higher level tool, uh, which was what I talked about in the beginning there, that kubedm does only so much in this middle layer and can't know about all the cluster uh, global information. And uh, that's why we have um, higher level tools like COPS, CubeSpray, uh, different installers, EKS, CTL, uh, well, WeWorks service, uh, WeWorks Kubernetes platform, et cetera, et cetera, that are or cluster API implementations. Those are the ones that know everything about the cluster and everything about the environment. But once they know stuff about the environment, they become really specific. Uh, so if I, if I create an implementation that runs kubeidem on, on Google Cloud, then I have to write a lot of code that is Google specific. And then if I wanted to port it to Amazon, that's a lot of work in doing so. So that's the, the essential idea of kubeidem is that there's stuff we need to do, everyone need to do. And uh, that's why we have kubeidem as a tool that at least combines all that experience in one binary. And this really generic can be, um, be run anywhere. But that's also, as it is so generic and doesn't know anything about the environment, you need to feed it here and in kubeidem join. Excellent, thanks. Uh, just letting people know, if you joined a little bit later, we explained how some of our sessions will go to the 60 minute mark. So this is definitely one of them because we have so many questions. Um, so we'll have a hard stop in 10 minutes. Uh, might have already covered a lot of this, but the question was um, explaining uh, etcd high availability kind of overall. Is there anything else you want to add? Mm. I mean, uh, if I go here, um, check out documentation, uh, and there we have different um, frequently asked questions. I guess that it's in one of these. So here you can find different, more technical answers to why, why do you need odd numbers? What is the maximum cluster size fault tolerance? This is what I talked about, that if you have a cluster size of three, you need two to have a majority and you can afford to lose one. If you have four, that doesn't change. And if you have five, you need three to have a majority, but now you can lose two. And um, there's a lot of different different information here, um, but it's kind of all um, to uh, to detail to, to be able to go into directly. Um, here is one, one guide to running etcd manually on different, and you see that there's a lot of you need to feed it a lot of information to, to do. And this is what kubeidm now with this new dash dash control plane spares you for each, um, yeah, for, for <laughs> uh, each node or control plane node. 
And uh, yeah, and that, this is also what I started with in the beginning. This is uh, why we create in Cluster Lifecycle a project called etcd ADM. So we have a thing that you do etcd ADM in it, and it creates an etcd cluster. Um, and you, um, or like a etcd first peer, and then you do etcd uh, ADM join, I think. Uh, yes, there. So, well, to, to add another peer. And um, this is still in alpha, um, but, but it's, a, it's a beginning project and helps you operate a TD specifically for running Kubernetes control planes. Cool, thank you. Uh, another question is um, when you've um, created a new cluster and you have new master nodes, how do you inform the load balancer of these new master nodes? Well, I hate to say it, but that's up to you. Uh, <laughs> uh, again, um, there is, and th that's why we have a hundred of different uh, certified. So, so like if we go here to, to CNCF, okay, it's conformance. We have a lot of, here is the, the certified Kubernetes um, repo and if we go check 114, we have all these different certified providers that have integrations with various environments. So, so like, yeah, that, <laughs> I won't select anyone, but there's like, there's a lot of different uh, choice and there's a lot of choice just because there are so many environments to integrate with. And these are the things that Kubernetes can't know about. So you need to write custom code to integrate something like an API server addition to um, propagate that information to the load balancer. Cool, thanks. Uh, is it correct that etcd quorum loss doesn't affect cluster resources that are already deployed? As far as I know, you simply cannot post new requests. So say, say that again. So is it correct that etcd quorum loss doesn't affect cluster resources that are already deployed? Right. Yes. So if if you have three, um, if you have three a uh, cluster of three, and you lose two nodes or peers, that one replica that is left. Uh, has now lost majority, so it can't have any new writes, but you can still read everything from it. And one um, thing that is clever with Kubernetes design is that if we go back to the architecture here somewhere, is that although you lose at CD, for example, here, it doesn't actually affect your workloads. So if you lose at CD or if you even lose the whole master or control plane, your workloads will happily run <laughs> as, as they used to. There, nothing will really change other than that if you first lose your control plane and now uh, you're in a read-only state and then one of your nodes go down or workloads or whatever, then it won't auto-heal, but it will still continue running. So, so yes, uh, it's correct that if you lose quorum, Everything will go in read-only mode, and uh, but nothing will happen with your workloads. Neither if you lose your API server. Excellent. Uh, we're down to the last couple. <laughs> How does a pod or container know to communicate with that specific pod or container from another node? That is um, done by kube proxy. So there's in this networking layer. There's also one Kubernetes chipped part which is called kube proxy. Oh, well, I, I have here. So it manages the, the different services that exist and uh, matches the, the services 
uh, to different pod endpoints. And the pod endpoints in turn are, um, here we have it. So in this case, WeaveNet is a pod network. So it provides cluster-wide overlay networking, for example, for pod-to-pod -pod communication. But if you're from a pod call, I want to see, I want to connect the service Nginx, it's first the kube proxy that resolve a virtual IP, which Nginx points to. Um, so there's like three layers. First, there's, if you say curl Nginx in a pod, it's first going to look up the Nginx name to the to core DNS. And core DNS is going to give you back the service virtual IP. It goes then to kube proxy, which has in IP table rules or RPVS or similar, it maps the, the service IP, virtual IP, to the set, different set of endpoints for ports that are existing. And lastly, the pod network actually transfers, which it could be WeaveNet, actually transfers the packets over the network. Excellent. And actually, the last one was a comment to the previous uh, discussion. So hopefully, people are able to see that. So thank you, Lucas. Thanks to everybody. As you can see from Lucas's screen, it's all, almost uh, 9 p.m. his time, so it's getting pretty late. So um, I will just share my closing um, slide. I'm going to do this. One second, I'll take over. So thanks again for joining and thanks for all your great questions. Uh, if you're new to this, this is something that we're running on Tuesdays, um, but sometimes we have special events on other days of the week. For example, tomorrow, Lucas will join us yet again at late in his time to introduce his new project, Ignite, which works with uh, Firecracker and we call it, uh, I forget what all the different tag phrases were, like the GitOps VMs or VMs for GitOps, uh, using <laughs> Docker interface or user experience. There's different ways to go about it. But if you're early, if you're curious about it, then um, uh, the best way is to uh, I'll advance my slide to go to our meetup page, the Weave User Group. Um, also, uh, you can email me. Here's my email address uh, in case there's a way that you can't find out. Of course, we also have our WeWork Slack channel. So, if you'd like to join us for tomorrow's talk and for our future talks on Tuesdays, uh, then uh, these are great ways to find out. But we'll be sending out an email, so hopefully you'll join us tomorrow. So thanks again to everybody, and thanks to Lucas at this late hour. I will see you again. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Bye.